thank you all for coming. Earlier this year, I was invited to give a talk at the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. And the invitation came from a man, an Englishman, named Andrew Motion, who a distinguished poet, novelist, biographer, man of letters, former poet laureate. And I replied by saying via email, Dear Sir Andrew, comma, parenthesis, I've waited my whole life to begin a letter this way. <laughs> Anybody with even a vestige of Anglophilia has got to love a country that honors its men and women of letters with honors and lordships and things of that sort. So we have Sir Andrew and Dame Hermione Lee and Dame Judy Dench, who, when she was once giving a, an Oscar in Hollywood and came out to the stage, the orchestra played, there is nothing like a dame. <laughs> and the house was, was del deliciously uh, appreciative. And tonight, we have Sir Jonathan Bate. This is old technology, the book. This is new technology, the telephone, which is going to help me make my introduction if I can find the right thing. Yes, here we are. Uh, we have Sir Jonathan Bate, who has been since 2006 a commander of the British Empire, and he's been a knight since 2015. At the same time, like his uh, countryman, Sir Andrew Motion, Jonathan has been a, uh, significant, significantly alert to and appreciative of the values of American higher education, so that since 2019, he has been, I have to get the title right, uh, the Foundation Professor of Environmental Humanities at Arizona State University in Phoenix. Environmental studies is only one of Jonathan Bates' many interests, one of several strings to his bow. To list all of those interests, not to mention his books, essays, work for the BBC, the RSC, and the theater in general, would preempt the time for his lecture tonight, so I will let you look those things up if you wish to. He began his academic career at Cambridge and among his important university teachers there, get this, were the young Christopher Ricks, the great social socialist uh, scholar Raymond Williams, and uh, Sir Frank Kermode. As a professor himself, he's held posts at Liverpool, Warwick, and Worcester College at Oxford. His first book was called Shakespeare and the English Romantic Imagination. It came out in 1976, when I, as a 86. young... I'm sorry, what did I say? 86. What, 1856? <laughs> 1986. 1986. Many years ago. Thank you for the correction. Um, and I, as a young scholar with an interest in Wordsworth, Keats, et al., devoured it voraciously um, when it appeared in 1986. Uh, and that was followed by more forays into Shakespeare and into biography, first one of John Clare, the English Romantic poet, and then in 2015, a biography, an enormous biography of the late Ted Hughes, more textual studies, more work on Shakespeare, and a growing interest in literature and ecology, uh, a field now called eco-criticism, which produced books like Romantic Ecology and The Song of the Earth. And it continues with a work in progress with the marvelous Marvellian title, The Garden, A Green History, which is a work in progress. For those of you who want to read something more informal and more personal, I recommend this, Mad About Shakespeare, spinning off on Noel Coward's Mad About the Boy, I presume, uh, which is a memoir both witty and deep detailing the author's lifelong engagement with the man from Stratford-upon-Avon, beginning in school, and then coming through university itself. 
Professor Bay tells the story of his first experience of understanding the nature of literary criticism and of metaphor when in school, his schoolmaster, I think this was fourth form maybe, John, fourth form, um, took a line, specific line, the line was, light thickens and the crow makes way to the rookie wood. And the boys were able to unpack that line and Jonathan was especially alert to that line because as an early ecological critic, though he didn't know it, he had been an avid birder and he could discuss in great detail the difference between a crow and a rook, which is an important part of the brilliance of that line. Surely that was a preamble to other pursuits that were coming along. Gradually, he decided to commit his life to books and to reading, and he quotes in the, in the memoir one of the great remarks of Dr. Johnson, who said the primary purpose of all literature is to help us better enjoy life or better to endure it. And I think many of us in this room would agree with that. Um, and just as young John Keats wanted to find Shakespeare, what he called the presider, over his work when he had a picture of Shakespeare uh, in his rooms when he was composing Endymion. So Jonathan Bate, first young and now mature, has done the same. His book ends, and I won't reveal the entire story, with a harrowing tale of family illness and cure, which reads like an episode in a late Shakespeare romance of death and rebirth, or like something from the comparable ending of Twelfth Night, where something that was formerly lost or thought lost is restored. It also features, this is one irresistible touch among many in the book, a Havanese puppy named Coco Chanel. So even Shakespeare's dogs get refreshed for a, a modern story. When Jonathan was knighted in 2015, his citation called him a true Renaissance man. And of course, the word Renaissance there can be understood in several equally important ways. And when our friend and neighbor and colleague on the James Merrill Committee, Ruth Saunders, who's not here tonight, um, nominated him to be a Merrill lecturer, she said that years ago when they were classmates at Cambridge, she decided to set herself up to pursue a PhD in English. But she said, when I saw, as she called him John, when I, when I saw that John was also doing this, I realized I didn't stand a chance. <laughs> so she went into another line of work at which she succeeded as brilliantly as Jonathan has in his line of work. To understand the bedazzlement of his uh, erstwhile classmate and the ennobling gratitude of his nation, please welcome Jonathan Bate, whose talk this evening is called Near the Ocean, Rachel Carson, and the New England Poets. Thank you very much. Thank you, Willard, for that eloquent and excessively generous introduction. Thank you, everyone, for coming, especially the students, and thank you to the Merrill House Committee for this invitation. Uh, it's fantastic to be here in Stonington and to, uh, to have spent the night in the Merrill apartment. I'm going to talk about the sea. You can hear the sound of the sea all through Western literature, perhaps all through world literature. One of the starting points of Western literature is the Odyssey of Homer, a sea story. In the Middle Ages, everybody who read tended to know Latin, but not Greek. So Homer's Odyssey was translated into Latin, ac postquam ad navem descendum. In the early 20th century, the great American poet Ezra Pound set out to write his epic poem, The Cantos, and he took those lines from a Latin translation of the Odyssey, and they became his poem, and then went down to the ship, set keel to break her forth on the godly sea, and off went Ezra Pound. And then towards the end of the 20th century, the great Caribbean poet, Derek Walcott, took the Homeric story of the Odyssey and rewrote it from the point of view of Caribbean fishermen, globalizing the Anglophone tradition of literature. 
So the sea is everywhere in literature, both a mythological sea, a sea that becomes symbolic, but also a real sea. Like as the waves make to the pebbled shore, so do our minutes hasten to their end, wrote Shakespeare, who never travelled on the sea, but certainly saw the sea when his acting company went on tour to Dover. The sea is always there. John Keats went to be cured by the sea, the sea cure. He went to the Isle of Wight um, when, when he was unwell and wrote a sonnet called Bright Star, in which he imagined a constant star looking down at the moving waters, at their priest-like task of pure ablution round Earth's human shore. The shore is the place where humankind meets the ocean. It's a borderline between the land and the sea. So we have a mythological sea, a poetic tradition of the sea, but we also have a real sea. And today I just want to talk about a few writers from the second half of the 20th century who spent much of their time and drew much of their imaginative power from this shoreline. I begin with a clip from, uh, the, the audio is not brilliant, but I hope you'll catch it, um, from a rather old radio interview. I remember being appalled when someone criticized me for beginning just like John Donne, but not quite managing to finish like John Donne. And I felt the weight of English literature on me at that point. As far as language goes, I'm an American. I'm afraid I'm an American. My accent's American. My way of talk is an American way of talk. The poets that excite me most are the Americans. In particular, my background is, um, may I say, German and Austrian. On one side, I'm a first-generation American. On one side, I'm a second-generation American. And I was brought up on, on the northern coast of, of Massachusetts, and my whole childhood was spent on the ocean. I remember the, the very spectacular hurricanes we used to have, where my grandmother's cellar would be flooded and there would be sharks washed up in the garden and so forth. And the image of the sea has been with me ever since, even though I've, I've um, been inland for a few years, and I think one always goes back to, to something as vivid and colorful as this sort of experience, and I know that the sea comes into um, a great many of my poems. Sometimes it's just a, a subconscious sea, a sort of flow of thoughts and so on. Other times it's the real sea itself. We moved from Jamaica Plain to Winthrop in 1937. We had been down there visiting Grandma and Grandpa, who were living at Point Shirley, and the children were so happy on the beach. My husband was failing in health, and that was the real main reason. I wanted to be near my parents. We loved the shore, we loved the house, and I hope, of course... Sylvia Plath's father, of course, did not recover and his death was the original traumatic event that led to her first suicide attempt and that in many ways shaped her whole identity, her whole being. Sylvia Plath, of course, went as a Fulbright scholar to Cambridge where she met Ted Hughes, the English poet, and they then came back to, to New England. She taught for a while at Smith, her alma mater. He taught at Amherst very briefly. Um, and they then spent time um, on the Cape Cod shoreline. This is Ted Hughes writing to his mother-in-law, Aurelia Plath. I brought a load of books out of the library, two of them by Rachel Carson, books about life in the sea, which are wonderful. Sylvia is in raptures. I started one yesterday and couldn't put it down till I'd finished it completely. And two letters from the same time, July 1958, from Sylvia to her mother. I'm reading the delightful book, The Sea Around Us, by Rachel Carson. Ted is reading her Under the Sea Wind, which he says is also fine. Do read these if you haven't already. They're poetically written but magnificently informative. I am going back to the ocean as my poetic heritage. And you heard her in that clip towards the end of her life talking of being drawn back to the sea of her childhood and how it was an undercurrent in so many of her poems. And then in another letter, could you, through your Boston University discount place, get me two books for Ted's birthday? They are The Sea Around Us by Rachel Carson. We've read it, but Ted would like to own it. And the book of poems by Lord, by, sorry, the book of poems Lord Weary's Castle by Robert Lowell, about 1946. Sylvia so Plath's phrase, poetically written but magnificently informative, is a perfect summation 
of the three books about the sea that Rachel Carson wrote in the 1950s before she came famous in the early 1960s with the publication of Silent Spring, her indictment of the pesticide DDT, which in many ways founded the modern environmental movement. The first was called Under the Sea Wind. Didn't do particularly well, um, but then she published The Sea Around Us in 1951, and it became a huge million-selling bestseller. It allowed her to give up her job at, at uh, Woods Hole as a marine biologist and become a full-time writer. And towards the end of the 1950s, she wrote about the shoreline in a third book, The Edge of the Sea. Her sensibility was deeply informed by poetry. She read much poetry as a child. You can perhaps just see um, on uh, the, the, the image of uh, the first book. There's an epigraph there. While the, while the sun and the rain live, these shall be, till a last wind's breath upon all these, all these blowing rolls the sea. Swinburne. It's a quotation from one of her favourite poets, Algernon Charles Swinburne, a poet not much read now, a late Victorian romantic who wrote in a very fluent, high style, uh, but was obsessed with the sea. His, his earliest memory, he said, um, was of being a, a little infant stripped naked by his father and thrown into the waves of the North Sea. Uh, and I can tell you the North Sea is cold. <laughs> so Carson has a poetic sensibility and she finds a kind of poetry in the sea itself. This is what she writes. The winds, the sea, and the moving tides are what they are. If there is wonder and beauty and majesty in them, science will discover these qualities. If they are not there, science cannot create them. If there is poetry in my book about the sea, it is not because I deliberately put it there, but because no one could write truthfully about the sea and leave out the poetry. Although our knowledge of marine science, and particularly of the origins of the sea, the origins of the moon, have moved on since the 1950s, Carson was nevertheless aware of the enormous importance of the sea within the global system that scientists now speak of as the Earth system. This is what she writes in The Sea Around Us. There are recurrent schemes, she says, writing about modern science, for deliberately changing or attempting to change the pattern of the currents and so modifying climate at will. For the globe as a whole, the ocean is the great regulator, the great stabiliser of temperatures. Without the ocean, our world would be visited by unthinkably harsh extremes of temperature. It is an excellent absorber and radiator of heat. And then she writes... Now, in our own lifetime, we are witnessing a startling alteration of climate. It is now established beyond question that a definite change in the Arctic climate set in about 1900. The frigid top of the world is very clearly warming up. So she's writing this in 1951 in the sea around us. Indeed, two years later, she published a scientific paper, The Edge of the Sea, noting that phenomenon of the recent warming of the oceans and how it was causing ecological disruption. But of course, like other scientists of that era, she didn't have the conception of anthropogenic climate change, the awareness that, it was that carbon emissions were the primary cause of that warming. When it came to the second edition of The Sea Around Us, just before the publication of Silent Spring, she was more concerned about the phenomenon of the dumping of nuclear waste off Cape Cod. She wrote a new preface for the book, in which she says, there has long been a certain comfort in the belief that the sea at least was inviolate, beyond man's ability to change and to despoil. But this belief, unfortunately, has proved to be naive. In unlocking the secrets of the atom, modern man has found himself confronted with a frightening problem. What to do with the most dangerous materials that have ever existed? The stark problem that faces him is whether he can dispose of these lethal substances without rendering the earth uninhabitable. No account of the sea today is complete unless it takes note of this ominous problem. The whole practice, despite protestations of safety by the regulatory agency, rests on the most insecure basis of fact. 
And this was something that began to emerge in journalistic reports in the late 1950s, the early 1960s, the consequences of what one newspaper called the atomic garbage man. Ted Hughes, late in life, said in an interview that his first big shock as an environmentalist came when I read in a US magazine how the US government had been disposing of its nuclear waste since 1945, dumping it with domestic refuse in a few fathoms offshore of Boston seven days a week. So there is a dark background of environmental despoliation running through the writing of Carson and perhaps feeding over into the poets thinking about the ocean. What I want to suggest in this talk is not so much that Carson was a direct influence on the poets I'm going to talk about, though clearly that bit of evidence from Ted Hughes and Sylvia Plath shows that he, she was, as indeed does, I found, rummaging around James Merrill's book, books uh, in, in the apartment, a copy of The Sea Around Us. But her books were so influential in really opening up knowledge about the oceans and the shore that they affected subsequent writing by osmosis as much as through direct influence. Her books in the 1950s created a step change in public knowledge of the life of the oceans. They were written with an unprecedented combination of observational precision, the work of the scientist, the biologist, and aesthetic wonder, the work of the writer, the poet. Samuel Johnson once said, writing about the poet Alexander Pope, in this work are exhibited in a very high degree the two most engaging powers of an author. New things are made familiar, and familiar things are made new. And it's that quality that Carson's sea writings have. New things, things we didn't know about the sea, are made familiar. And familiar things, things we thought we did know, are made new. Carson is an eco-literary writer. Those books are poetic in themselves. So, I'm going to sort of work my way up and down the shoreline. Um, if you look at the map, uh, here we have Merrill in Stonington, and then go a little to the northeast, Carson, who worked at Woods Hole, just at the, uh, the, tip of, uh, the, the southern tip of Cape Cod before you go out onto the Cape. And from there you look across uh, to Nantucket, the, po the place where Robert Lowell set his key early poem, The Quaker Graveyard in Nantucket. You remember when Ted Hughes was asking his mother-in-law to get two books? It was the Carson book and Lord Weary's Castle, the first book of the poet Robert Lowell. Then we go north to Port Shirley, uh, Point Shirley and Winthrop, uh, which is where, uh, as you saw in that clip, where, where Plath spent her childhood. And then we go up to Maine, um, and uh, we find Carson's summer home, where she found great happiness uh, with, with, with her lover uh, on Southport Island. And further north um, in Maine, we find North Haven, uh, where the poet Elizabeth Bishop um, found a home. Um, and... Uh, Castine, where Robert Lowell uh, spent his summers. Elizabeth Bishop uh, was a poet fascinated by geography. She makes us look across the four points of the compass. Um, her first book um, actually uh, had, uh, and she asked for this um, on its title page, it had a compass, the figure of a compass with the four points. Bishop's poetry looks north towards the Nova Scotia of her childhood. Um, and then south towards Brazil, uh, where she found happiness, she found another life. And also, pointing south, we look down um, towards Palm Beach to Florida, uh, where Merrill uh, had uh, a childhood uh, family home um, and where he, he also had a home later in life. And then um, that quote from Sylvia Plath, uh, talking about feeling the weight of English literature upon her, people complaining her poems began like John Donne but didn't end like John Donne. Always the compass looks east towards that English poetic tradition from which these New England poets draw so much but also wish to break free. first one is one of the first poems I ever published. I hate to think how many years old it is. But <clears throat> it's called The Map. 
Land that lies in water that is shadowed green. Shadows, or are they shallows? At its edges showing the line of long, seaweeded ledges where weeds hang to the simple blue from green. Or does the land lean down to lift the sea from under, drawing it unperturbed around itself? Along the fine, tan, sandy shelf is the land tugging at the sea from under. The shadow of Newfoundland lies flat and still. Labrador is yellow, where the moony Eskimo has oiled it. We can stroke these lovely bays under a glass as if they were expected to blossom, or as if to provide a clean cage for invisible fish. The names of seashore towns run out to sea. The names of cities cross the neighboring mountains. The printer here experiencing the same excitement as when emotion too far had seeds its cause. These peninsulas take the water between thumb and finger like women feeling for the smoothness of yard goods. Mapped waters are more quiet than the land is lending the land their waves' own confirmation. And Norway's hair runs south in agitation. Profiles investigate the sea where land is. Are they assigned, or can the countries pick their colors? What suits the character or the native waters best? Topography displays no favorites. North's is near as west, more delicate than the historians are the map makers' colors. Elizabeth Bishop was a truly great poet who hated reading her poetry aloud, and I don't actually think she read it aloud very well, and she was pretty old, that was not long before her, before her death. It's a marvellous poem, that's one of her earliest poems, The Map, um, and it, it, she, so she's looking at a map and she's thinking about the difference between um, the, the, the geography, the ecology um, of land and sea as they really are and the way in which we interpret them through mapping. We interpret land and sea through mapping but also through history, through stories. More delicate than the historians are the map makers' colours. She ends her poem. But what she's in particularly interested in this poem is that sense of the coastline as, as border, the difference between the colours of the land um, on the one side of the map and the, the, the green or blue of the, sea, of the sea on the other. The poet is always a figure mediating between, on the edge between, their use of language and their observation of the natural world around them. So, the shoreline. I want to suggest that one thing that these poets, Robert Lowell, Elizabeth Bishop, Sylvia Plath, James Merrill, one thing that they share with Rachel Carson is what I would like to call a coastal poetics. Now, by poetry, I mean a way of looking at the world with a combination of observation and wonder, of emotion and literary precision that doesn't necessarily require verse. Way back in the Elizabethan period, Sir Philip Sidney said, verse being but an ornament and no cause to poetry, there have been many most excellent poets that never versified. And I'd like to suggest to you that Rachel Carson was a most excellent poet that never versified. Here is a segment uh, from the chapter in her book, The Edge of the Sea, uh, the chapter called Our Ever-Changing Shore. And it seems to me this, though in prose, is as poetic as any poetry you might read. The shore means many things to many people. Of its varied moods, the one usually considered typical is not so at all. The true spirit of the sea does not reside in the gentle surf that laps a sun-drenched bathing beach on a summer day. Instead, it is on a lonely shore at dawn or twilight, 
or in storm or midnight darkness, that we sense a mysterious something we recognise as the reality of the sea. For the ocean has nothing to do with humanity. It is supremely unaware of man. And when we carry too many of the trappings of human existence with us to the threshold of the sea world, our ears are dulled and we do not hear the accents of sublimity in which it speaks. Sometimes the shore speaks of the earth and its own creation. Sometimes it speaks of life. If we are lucky in choosing our time and place, we may witness a spectacle that echoes vast and elemental things. On a summer night, when the moon is full, the sea and the swelling tide and creatures of the ancient shore conspire to work primeval magic on many of the beaches from Maine to Florida. On such a night, the horseshoe crabs move in, just as they did under a Paleozoic moon, just as they have been doing through all the hundreds of millions of years since then, coming out of the sea to dig their nests in the wet sand and deposit their spawn. I juxtapose that to one of Sylvia Plath's explicitly shoreline poems. It's called Magnolia, Sh Magnolia Shoals, a reminiscence of um, that shoreline of her childhood, written in the very skilled poetic form of, of Tertza Rima, uh, the, the form where uh, little tri uh, triolets, stanzas of, of three lines, and the first and third ones rhyme, and then the middle line picks up and becomes the rhyme of the first and third um, of the next stanza although she, she does it using skilled half rhymes. This was written when she and Ted Hughes were on retreat at Yaddo in September of 1959, and most Plath scholars would say that was really the kind of the take-off point where she went from being an accomplished poet to a truly great and original poet. But notice here the, the use of precision, uh, the language of the particulars of the ecology of the shoreline. Up here among the gull cries... We stroll through a maze of pale, red-mottled relics, shells, claws, as if it were summer still. That season has turned its back. Through the green sea gardens stall, bow and, and bow, sorry, I beg your pardon. Through the, through the green sea gardens stall, bow and recover their look of the imperishable gardens in an antique book or tapestries on a wall, leaves behind us warp and lapse. The late month withers as well. Below us, a white gull keeps the weed-slicked shelf for his own, hustles other gulls off. Crabs rove over his field of stone. Mussels cluster blue as grapes. His beak brings the harvest in. The watercolorist grips his brush in the stringent air. The horizon's bare of ships. The beach and the rocks are bare. He paints a blizzard of gulls, wings drumming in the winter. She recognises there that the poet is like the watercolorist, an artist trying to represent the ecology of the shoreline, but in so doing, fixing it, not quite able to catch its constant motion. Turning from... Carson to Lowell, that other book that Ted Hughes asked his mother-in-law. Lowell's first great poem, first great sea poem, is the Quaker Graveyard in Nantucket. It's a poem about the sea, but it plugs into that literary, historical, mythic and elusive sea that I began with, the sea that goes back to Homer. The poem was written in memory of a relative of his, uh, Warren Winslow, dead at sea during the Second World War. Um, and it begins uh, with an epigraph, um, a quotation from the book of Genesis. Let man have dominion over the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the air. Reading that epigraph reminds me of a line in James Merrill's poem, Channel 13. It came down to this that merely naming the creatures spelt their doom. That moment in the book of Genesis where humankind is given dominion or mastery over the fishes of the sea, the birds of the air, the beasts of the land. Somehow a license for us to despoliate the environment, to use it only as resource rather than to value it. 
A brackish reach of shoal off Madaket, the sea was still breaking violently and night had steamed into our North Atlantic fleet when the drowned sailor clutched the dragnet. So begins young literary Lowell. I think that drowned sailor might be coming out of T.S. Eliot. And then the heel-headed dogfish barks its nose on Ahab's void and forehead. For a literary seagoer, you cannot get away from Captain Ahab and his Pequod and the pursuit of the white whale. All you recovered from Poseidon died with you, my cousin Poseidon, looking back to the ancient Greek god of the sea. When the whale's viscera go and the roll of its corruption overruns the world, this world beyond tree-swept Nantucket and Wood's Hole and Martha's Vineyard, sailor, will your sword whistle and fall and sink into the fat? The figure of Captain Ahab recurs. Of course, Nantucket is where the voyage begins in Moby Dick. So early Lowell is kind of locked into the literary sea. But then when he, he went to Castine, when he went to the main shore, he, he began really to see the sea, to look and to find a quieter voice. Elizabeth Bishop visited him there not long after the war. He very nearly proposed to her. Uh, that would not have been a good idea, given that she was a lesbian um, and that he was already married. Uh, very typical of Lowell. Um, but they formed a great friendship, and the, the Lowell Bishop correspondence is one of the great literary correspondences of all time. He wrote a poem in a very different kind of ocean voice, remembering their time together. The first is, the poem is called Water, and um, the setting is a small main town that's a fishing, commercial fishing village, not a tourist village, and... Um, it's a sort of love poem, the two people there in this town, visitors, sitting on a rock watching the water. And the water could stand both for sort of liberation, freedom, and uh, something soothing, and um, for something dangerous, that the water's too cold to swim in, you'd die if you're in it for long. Uh, um, those two things. And the poem started from an image that made no sense to me, that just came to me once as I was going to sleep about an iris rotting and turning purple. And uh, I held on to that, and it's... Uh, I still don't quite know what it means in the poem, but it's one of the centers. Water. It was the main lobster town. Each morning, boatloads of hands pushed off for granite quarries on the islands and left dozens of bleak, white frame houses stuck like oyster shells on a hill of rock. And below us, the sea lapped the raw little matchstick mazes of a weir where the fish for bait were trapped. Remember? We sat on a slab of rock. From this distance in time, it seems the color of iris rotting and turning purpler. But it was only the usual gray rock turning the usual green when drenched by the sea. The sea drenched the rock at our feet all day and kept tearing away flake after flake. One night you dreamed you were a mermaid clinging to a wharf pile and trying to pull off barnacles with your hands. We wished our two souls might return like gulls to the rock. In the end, the water was too cold for us. It's a very, very different style from, from that of the Quaker graveyard. Um, as you said in that in introduction, um, the sea suggesting on the one hand liberation, on the other hand danger. And the you of the poem whose bishop uh, dreaming that she was a mermaid. Plath too, in a, a, a memory of childhood, talked of her obsession with mermaids. The mermaid as the figure of the woman who does manage to become at one with the sea rather than divided from it. The ocean runs through so much of Lowell's work. In the late 1960s, he published a volume called Near the Ocean, um, which began with a poem called Near the Ocean, which rather confusingly has a subsection called Near the Ocean, but the first section is called Waking Early Sunday Morning, one of Lowell's finest and best-known poems. And it begins with a desire for, for freedom, and the desire takes the form of a comparison with 
the Chinook salmon, which comes from the sea to the land in order to spawn. Oh, to break loose like the Chinook salmon, jumping and falling back, nosing up to the impossible stone and bone-crushing waterfall, raw-jawed, weak-fleshed there, stopped by ten steps of the roaring ladder, and then to clear the top on the last try, alive enough to spawn and die. Stop. Back off. The salmon breaks water, and now my body wakes to feel the unpolluted joy and criminal leisure of a boy, no rainbow smashing a dry fly in the white run is free as I, here squatting like a dragon on time's hoard before the day's begun. So once again, a poem of a borderline. The ocean and then up the river from salt water to fresh. The night to the day and the memory back to childhood and the freedom of childhood. So often the sea reminds us of the freedom of childhood. In the sea around us, Rachel Carson has a wonderful chapter on the changing year, on the movement of the seasons. Spring moves over the temperate lands of our northern hemisphere in a tide of new life, of pushing green shoots and unfolding buds, all its mysteries and meanings symbolised in the northward migration of the birds, the awakening of sluggish amphibian life as the chorus of frogs rise again from the wetlands, the different sound of the wind which stirs the young leaves where a month ago it rattled the bare branches. These things we associate with the land, and it is easy to suppose that at sea there could be no such feeling of advancing spring. But the signs are there. And seen with understanding eye, they bring the same magical sense of awakening. In the spring, the sea is filled with migrating fishes, some of them bound for the mouths of great rivers, which they will ascend to deposit their spawn. Such are the spring-run Chinooks coming in from the deep Pacific feeding grounds to breast the rolling flood of the Columbia. The shad moving into the Chesapeake and the Hudson and the Connecticut. The alewives seeking a hundred coastal streams of New England. The salmon feeling their way to the Penobscot and the Kennebec. For months or years, these fish have known only the vast spaces of the ocean. Now the spring sea and the maturing of their own bodies lead them back to the rivers of their birth. At the end of Waking Early Sunday Morning, the first part of the Near the Ocean sequence, Lowell writes, famous stanza, Pity the planet, all joy gone from this sweet volcanic cone. This is the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Peace to our children when they fall in small war, beginnings of Vietnam, on the heels of small war, until the end of time to police the earth, the vision that America had for itself at that time, a ghost orbiting forever, lost in our monotonous sublime. When the secret itself ends, the final poem, Near the Ocean, he turns to the shore and the sea as a kind of image of permanence against that sense of the fragility of the planet that he is pitying, that he is pitying in the age of Cold War, of the fear of nuclear catastrophe and environmental degradation. Is it this shore, their eyes worn white as moons from hitting bottom? Night, the sand fleas scissoring their feet, the sand bed cooling to concrete, one borrowed blanket, lights of cars shining down at them like stars. Sand built the lost Atlantis, sand, Atlantic Ocean, condoms, litter on the beach, sand, sleep, sleep. The ocean, grinding stones, can only speak the present tense. Nothing will age, nothing will last or take corruption from the past. A hand, your hand then, I'm afraid to touch the crisp hair on your head. Monster loved for what you are, till time that buries us lay bare. The sea making one think of time, of mortality and perhaps eternity. But those sand fleas, again, the precision. Let me read another paragraph or two um, from The Sea and Its Shore, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, this is a, an early uh, piece of 
uh, Rachel Carson that she later incorporated into her Shoreline book. Like the ghost crab, the small amphipod known as the sand hopper or beach flea portrays one of those dramatic moments of evolution in which a creature abandons an old way of life for a new. Its ancestors were completely marine. Its remote descendants, if we read its future aright, will be terrestrial. Now it is midway in the transition from a sea life to a land life. As in all such transitional existences, there are strange little contradictions and ironies in its way of life. The sandhopper has progressed as far as the upper beach. Its predicament is that it is bound to the sea, yet menaced by the very element that gave it life. Apparently, it never enters the water voluntarily. It is a poor swimmer and may drown if long submerged. Yet it requires dampness and probably needs the salt in the beach sand. And so it remains in bondage to the water world. And I would suggest that in this, we are no different from the sand flea. We are bound to the sea, yet menaced by the very element that gives us life. We remain in bondage to the water world. Carson continues, the movements of the sand hoppers follow the rhythm of the tides and the alternation of day and night. On the low tides that fall during the dark hours, they roam far into the intertidal zone in search of food. They gnaw at bits of sea lettuce or eelgrass or kelp, their small bodies swaying with the vigour of their chewing. In the litter of the tide lines, they find morsels of dead fish or crab shells containing remnants of flesh. So the beach is cleaned and the phosphates, nitrates, and other mineral substances are recovered from the dead for use by the living. That sense of a natural process of cleaning the beach, the ecological work that is done by the sand flea. Of course, when beaches are littered by humans, we need more than sand fleas to clean them. One of Elizabeth Bishop's short stories that she wrote early in her career was called The Sea and Its Shore. And it's a rather strange story um, of uh, a man who lives in a hut on the beach um, and has a, a long pole with a spike uh, and he goes up and down the beach picking up litter. Um, and a lot of litter is uh, newspaper, uh, advertisements, pages from old books. Um, and then he goes back to his hut at night and starts reading them. He is, in a way, a, uh, a metaphor, a figure for the poet, picking up scraps from the beach, but relating them to a literary tradition. In the course of that story, um, Boomer, who's the name of the character, notices a bird on the shoreline. Boomer held up the lantern and watched a sandpiper rushing distractedly this way and that. It looked to his strained eyesight like a point of punctuation against the rounded rolling waves. It left fine prints with its feet. Print, you see, as in paper. Its feathers were speckled, and especially on the narrow hems of the wings appeared marks that looked as if they might be letters, if only he could get close enough to read them. Elizabeth Bishop, as a poet, is a reader of the marks of nature. She returned to the sandpiper in a later poem, although I'm pretty sure uh, that the bird in question was actually a sanderling, not a sandpiper. Closely related bird. What sandpiper and sanderling have in common is a huge migratory range, all the way from Newfoundland and the Arctic down to the tip of South America. Bishop herself uh, was brought up in Nova Scotia, moved down to Brazil, uh, lived for a time in Florida, as well as in Maine. Uh, Elizabeth Bishop, migratory poet. Uh, she herself said she was perhaps like the sandpiper. There's a reference here to some famous lines of William Blake that I've juxtaposed to the poem for you. I love this poem. The roaring alongside, that's the sea, he takes for granted, and that every so often the world is bound to shake. He runs, he runs to the south, finical, awkward, in a state of controlled panic, a student of Blake. The beach hisses like fat. On his left, 
a sheet of interrupting water comes and goes and glazes over his dark and brittle feet. He runs, he runs straight through it, watching his toes, watching rather the spaces of sand between them, where, no detail too small, the Atlantic drains rapidly backwards and downwards. As he runs, he stares at the dragging grains. Like Blake, he sees a world in a grain of sand. The world is a mist, and then the world is minute and vast and clear. The tide is higher or lower, he couldn't tell you which. His beak is focused, he is preoccupied, looking for something, something, something. Poor bird, he is obsessed. The millions of grains are black, white, tan and grey, mixed with quartz grains, rose and amethyst. No detail too small could indeed be the watchword of Bishop's own exquisite poetry. I mentioned that uh, Rachel Carson's first book, Under the Sea Wind, wasn't particularly successful, but after the sea around us became a huge bestseller, um, it, was, uh, it was reprinted in Life magazine. And in that reprint, um, there's a passage uh, about a sandaling um, that seems to me remarkably, uh, remarkably similar to the Bishop poem. Um, I, shan't, I shan't read it all, but uh, just to give you um, a little bit of a, uh, the, the flavour of it. At daybreak and the half-tide, two small sandalings ran beside the dark water on the ocean beach of the barrier island, keeping in the thin film at the edge of the, epping, of the, of the ebbing surf. They were trim little birds in rust and grey plumage, and they ran with a twinkle of black feet over the hard-packed sand where puffs of blown spume or sea froth rolled like thistledown. As the two sandalings probed the wet sand for small, thin-shelled crustaceans, they forgot the long flight of the night before in the excitement of the hunt. For the moment, they forgot, too, that faraway place which they must reach before many days had passed, a place of vast tundras, snow-fed snow -fed lakes and midnight sun. Blackfoot, leader of the migrant flock, was making his fourth journey from the southernmost tip of South America to the Arctic nesting grounds of his kind. In his short lifetime, he had travelled more than 60,000 miles, following the sun north and south across the globe, some 8,000 miles, spring and fall. James Merrill was an enormous admirer of Elizabeth Bishop, and many of her books are there in, in the Merrill apartment. Um, when her collected poems were published after her death, he wrote a fabulous review of her in the Washington Post book world. Um, and it ends in saying this about um, her voice. Whether this voice says hard and disabused things or humorous and gentle ones, its emotional pitch remains so true and its intelligence so unaffected that we hear in it the touch of nature which makes the whole world kin. Is this an obsolete way to judge poetry? I cannot envy anyone who thinks so. To move towards my conclusion and turn to Merrill himself, as I've said, poetry is often associated, the poetry of the seaside is often associated with childhood. Um, as a scion of the Merrill Banking uh, dynasty, uh, there was a very splendid uh, winter home down in Palm Beach. Um, and so we find Merrill um, as a teenager uh, uh, at, at school writing a poem called Palm Beach. Uh, this is the original manuscript of it. In winters, to be war in winters to be warm as toast, go far down the Atlantic coast. Across the lake from Florida, Palm Beach is almost torrida. To shun deep snow and icy sleet, upon this isle friends plan to meet. Some spend their time forever saying how prettily the palms are swaying. Or, sorry, or, 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 how perf or how superb the weather is while they fill up on soda fizz. <laughs> sorry, a little hard to make out the handwriting there, but uh, not James Merrill's greatest poem, but you know, a start uh, in Palm Beach uh, as, as, as a teenager. Um, it seemed to me thinking about 
the poet, the way the sea runs through Merrill's poetry. Um, there's a movement that in, in some ways is the reverse of that of Robert Lowell. I was suggesting how Lowell began with that literary elusive kind of allegorical use of the sea and then moved towards something more observational. Seems to me with Merrill it's the opposite. So an early poem, Accumulations of the Sea 3, is a poem of observation and memory, perhaps quite closely akin to uh, the Plath poem uh, that, that, that we read. We watch the skeletons of childhood sunken in sockets of the beach, oyster white stone, bone, shell, sophistications of nostalgia, a music as of time on the Victrola, clearly associating the beach with childhood pleasures. Composed among misfortunes of smooth bone, a pearl delusion in the ear creates familiar madrigals like those of sleep, builds these organic trophies. So coral builds its chamber music in the skull. The ear more labyrinthine than the coiling shell will echo it. The pebbled eye propelled by the elastic rhythms of the tide, the hand that falls to quiet each swelling wave, are ambered in a cone of time. But children, barefoot with baskets holding starfish, come to skim the flat stones, stare at cloudlessness. And a gull, carousing in angelic weather, prints with its image white cascading octaves mounting beyond perception. And the sky is vibrant and the sea again unsounded. It's a beautiful poem. It's really, it's really clean. It's beautifully observed. Um, he takes um, the shell to the ear, hears the music of the sea, and it makes him think of music. He's a great lover of music, Merrill, of course. Um, and that, that sense of, of nostalgia, uh, the, the child barefoot on the beach with the, with the basket holding the starfish. And very, um, very, very touching indeed. But if we then turn to a later poem um, at Palm Beach, um, a poem shadowed by death um, and a less happy memory, particularly um, uh, a, a poem uh, that is in many ways rejecting um, the associations of his wealthy banking dynasty. Um, so the Portuguese man of war, that rather fearsome um, kind uh, of, of, of sea creature wa washed up um, on the shore. Uh, I've put an image of, of one for you there. It begins with an, an image of the beach itself like a kind of animal um, but washed up and dead. A mile long vertebrate picked clean to the palm's tall sea bleached incurving ribs. The soil poor white, like talcum mixed with grit. But up came polymorphous green, no sooner fertilised than clipped, where glimmerings <coughs> from buried nozzles rose, and honey gravel driveways led to a perpetual readiness of tombs, shell white outside or white on white, the dropping bird motif still wet, pastel and madrepore the shuttered rooms, Nacreous jetsam, wave on wave, having swept our late excrescences away, the wens and wives to mirror smoke place settings for the skin diver after dark. The extra man drowning by candlelight, whose two minds reel. I think in many ways Merrill sees himself as the extra man, the outsider, not part of this, this well to do network of his family. How to be potent and unsexed, worth a million and expendable. How to be everybody's dish and not have seen through the glass visor which would be made of him some night by the anemone's flamed chiffon gowns like those downtown in the boutiques, by razor labis of hangers-on, sorry, by razor labia of hangers-on to territories this or that, tiny hideous tycoon stakes out Empire wholly built upon albino slaves, the fossil globules of a self-creating, self-dissolving scheme, giddy in scope, pedantic in detail, over which random baby gorgons float without recognition, it would seem with their own purple airs, inflate and ganglia agonisingly outlive. Look out! One has been blown ashore. 
for tomorrow's old wet nurse to come, ease from the dry breast and sheet in foam. It's a poem of a disillusioned man, I think. But what I found in all these poets, as in Carson, is exactly this combination of the sense of freedom that can be brought by looking beyond the human to the realm of the sea and the shoreline, but also that sense of awe, of fear, that sense that the sea is somehow so much greater than us. We are so insignificant beside it, and it has the power to destroy. The sea, then, as bringing both the comfort of childhood memory, but also the fear of annihilation and, in our time, environmental catastrophe. In that early uh, at the beginning of my lecture um, passage from Sylvia Plath, uh, she mentioned hurricanes. Uh, there was a very famous hurricane uh, along this shoreline in 1938, um, and she remembered that uh, in her, her, her childhood rem reminiscence. She actually misdates it to 1939. Um, one of the very last pieces she wrote, um, the BBC in London asked her to um, uh, to, to talk about her childhood for a radio programme, and she wrote the script, but took her own life before she was able um, to, 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 to deliver it. Um, and it begins like this. My childhood landscape was not land, but the end of the land, the cold, salt, running hills of the Atlantic. I sometimes think my vision of the sea is the clearest thing I own. I pick it up, exile that I am, like the purple lucky stones I used to collect with a white ring all the way round, or the shell of a blue mussel with its rainbowy angel's fingernail interior, and in one wash of memory the colours deepen and gleam. The early world draws breath. I'm going to end with um, the reading uh, that an actress uh, undertook uh, for her, for, for, for the BBC, uh, after she'd taken her own life. And you'll hear at the beginning of this um, how she crawls towards the sea as a child. And it, it's almost as if um, she's, she is crawling towards, towards death, towards mortality, towards eternity, even from that early age. And then she ends by speaking of that, that hurricane. Um, so this is the, 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 the final word from, from Sylvia Plath, Plath from um, her, her reminiscence, which is called Ocean 1212W. Ocean 1212W When I was learning to creep, my mother set me down on the beach to see what I thought of it. I crawled straight for the coming wave and was just through the wall of green when she caught my heels. I often wonder what would have happened if I had managed to pierce that looking glass. Would my infant gills have taken over, the salt in my blood? For a time I believed not in God, nor Santa Claus, but in mermaids. The road I knew curved into the waves with the ocean on one side, and my grandmother's house. To this day I remember her phone number, Ocean 1212W. I would repeat it to the operator, an incantation of fine rhyme, half expecting the black earpiece to give me back like a conch, the susurrus of the sea out there, as well as my grandmother's hello. My final memory of the sea is of violence. A still, unhealthily yellow day in 1939. The sea molten, steely slick, heaving at its leash like a broody animal. Thank you very much.